The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The 23rd Psalm is probably the most popular of the Psalms in the Old Testament. It is typically associated with funeral liturgies and is often quoted during wedding ceremonies. The Eastern Orthodox Church typically includes this psalm in their Eucharist service. Traditionally, in the Jewish faith, the 23rd Psalm is sung during the third Sabbath meal. Why such popularity? The imagery of the 23rd Psalm is touching and heartwarming. God being portrayed as a loving and caring shepherd leading and feeding his flock. Could this Psalm be more than the poetic writings of King David? With hindsight, we see Jesus in the imagery of this psalm. When King David penned these words, Jesus had not yet come. Is it possible that our beloved 23rd Psalm is a messianic prophecy predicting the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? Let's see. In episode one, we are introduced to the truth that the Lord is our shepherd. In this episode, we will focus on the reality that the 23rd Psalm is messianic in nature and finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The first thing David witnessed was that the Lord was his shepherd. This metaphor would be natural to David because his early years were spent being a shepherd. He understood the duties and responsibilities of shepherding a flock. King David envisioned God as the great shepherd of Israel who would save and bless his inheritance. We see this pattern in Psalms 28. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. God revealed to David that he is the eternal shepherd who would carry his people forever. Is it possible that God selected David to be king because he had the heart of a shepherd? Should this be true, then we can see that the heart of God is the heart of a shepherd. The humble service of a shepherd is the best example we have 
of the loving heart of God. Could this declaration be more than a song of praise? Could David be uttering a prophecy that the future Messiah would come as a shepherd? Should Psalm 23 be a messianic psalm, then King David was not the only prophet who envisioned that the Messiah would come as a shepherd. Let's look to Isaiah. See, the Sovereign Lord comes with power, and His arm rules for Him. See, His reward is with Him, and His recompense accompanies Him. He tends His flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in His arms and carries them close to His heart. He gently leads those that have young. Isaiah clearly associated the shepherd with the coming Messiah. The great and powerful king will have the heart of a shepherd who tends his flock and gathers his lambs. Both David and Isaiah prophetically understood that the Lord God is the true shepherd of Israel. Why shouldn't the coming Messiah also be God's true shepherd. Let's look to Jesus. Even in the birth of Jesus Christ, there is a subtle prophetic significance. God revealed the birth of the Messiah to a band of shepherds who were in the field keeping watch over their flocks. God the eternal shepherd of Israel revealed this glorious event to humble shepherds because they were of like mind. God did not reveal this truth to the Jewish religious Sanhedrin because they would not have understood the importance of the event. In their thinking, the Messiah would come as a reigning king to sit on the throne of Israel. They did not imagine the Messiah being a lowly shepherd. They failed to understand that the heart of a shepherd qualified David for the throne of Israel. The inheritor of David's throne would first have to be a shepherd Therefore, the Messiah would have to come as a shepherd first. Jesus understood the prophetic significance of Psalm 23. He understood the importance of the Son of Man presenting himself to Israel as the Good Shepherd. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He also said, I am the Good Shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Jesus also understood, I and my Father are one. The heart of the Father is the heart of a shepherd. It is only logical for the Messiah to come as a shepherd before he would reveal himself as our reigning king. Now that we have established the truth that David's poetic psalm is a prophetic song revealing the life and ministry of the Messiah, then we should see the life and ministry of Jesus in the remaining verses of Psalm 23. Let's see. The Messiah will come, performing the duties of a shepherd. He will cause the sheep of Israel to lie down in green pastures and find resting places 
besides still waters. Jesus understood that he was the good shepherd and the true flock of Israel would follow him. He also understood that he was the gate. Let's read. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What is Jesus a gate to? He made it clear that those who enter the sheepfold of God must pass through the gate and be saved. The green pastures of the Messiah is the free gift of salvation he brings. King David also said that the Messiah would lead his flock beside still waters. What does this represent in the ministry of Jesus? Jesus answered this question when he met the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus associated the water we drink with the eternal life he gives to his sheep. Jesus also, on the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, told the crowd that those who believe in him would have living water flowing in their souls. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. The Messiah, functioning as the Good Shepherd, will lead his flock beside the still waters and encourage his sheep to drink. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. The messianic still waters is the eternal life he brings. The messianic still waters also represent the waters of baptism. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus commanded his disciples to preach the gospel to all nations and lead their converts to the still waters of baptism. The book of Acts confirms that the apostles did this very thing. We see Peter, on the day of Pentecost, urge all believers to repent and be baptized. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We also see Peter command that Cornelius and his family be baptized. 
can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So the Messiah would usher in an age of green pastures and still waters. Would the Messiah have need for his own soul to be restored? This is an interesting question. I think the answer is yes. We have three recorded events when Jesus went up to a mountain to pray, away from the crowd. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, we read, that Jesus spent all night in prayer. Why? To me, the answer is simple. To restore his soul in isolated prayer with his Father. The Bible presents another example where Jesus was in despair and needed his soul restored. And that is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Jesus earnestly prayed that God would change his mind and allow the cup of Calvary to pass away from him. According to Luke, the agony reached such a point that he sweat big drops of blood. God sent an angel to strengthen him. At this point, God restored the soul of his Messiah. We no longer see Jesus reacting in great fear. According to David, the Messiah would have a ministry of restoration. Do we see this ministry in Jesus Christ? The answer is yes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus taught that those who follow him would find rest for their souls. One of the benefits of being in the sheepfold of the Messiah would be to experience the restoration of our sin-riddled souls. The ministry of the Messiah would be a ministry of restoration. David also said that the Messiah would lead his flock in the paths of righteousness. What could this mean? What kind of righteousness are we talking about? The only righteousness that stirs the heart of God is the righteousness found in his person. The character of God is filled with rectitude and justice. Micah the prophet understood that the path of righteousness would require that we respond with justice and mercy and walk humbly with our God. He hath shown thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. How could the Messiah lead in righteousness without him being righteous also? Just remember 
that Jesus said that he and his Father are one. By the time of Jesus Christ, righteousness morphed into a legal system, void of the character of God. The Jewish religious system valued the tradition of the elders more than the Word of God. They allowed their legalism to form an excessive religious burden that the people could not carry. Religion about God was more important than relationship with God. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus warned the people that the righteousness taught by the scribes and Pharisees would lead them to hell. The shepherd led the flock of Israel down the path of true righteousness. What does the messianic path of righteousness look like? Micah shined the light on the path of righteousness when he said, We are to love justice and mercy and walk humbly with our God. Jesus taught that his path would include interaction with the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believed not in me of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. The path of righteousness includes reproving of sin, walking in judgment, and allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal the righteousness of God in us. The Apostle Paul went in great depth when he said that righteousness of God will be revealed by and through faith. Paul also realized that Abraham discovered the path of righteousness through faith. The Messianic Shepherd will lead his flock down the paths of righteousness this is what David envisioned the shepherd would do. Did King David witness the Messiah walking through the valley of the shadow of death? Obviously he did. But do we see Jesus Christ experiencing the shadow of death. We see Jesus wrestling with the shadow of death in the Garden of Gethsemane. He struggled with his impending death to the point that he sweat drops of blood. We see Jesus, the Messiah, walking through the valley of the shadow of death on his way to Golgotha. For six hours, Jesus endured the horror and suffering of the cross as he looked death in the face. Did Jesus fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 23? Clearly, the answer is yes. But could this prophecy be describing much more? Again, the answer is yes. The phrase, 
the valley of the shadow of death has a historical root that describes the grave and Shiloh, the Jewish realm of the dead. Jewish tradition presents Shiloh as the abode of the dead, where the deceased are gathered in their tribes and families. Hence, the expression occurring in the Pentateuch, to be gathered to one's people or to go to one's fathers. Prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel both describe Shiloh as the lower parts of the earth and the pit where the dead are gathered with the people of old time. When I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time and shall set thee in the lower parts of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down to the pit that thou be not inhabited and I shall set glory in the land of the living. What connection would the Messiah have with Shiloh? Psalms 23 alludes to the fact that the Messiah would walk through the valley of the shadow of death with his rod and staff. The New Testament clearly teaches that when Jesus died on the cross, his soul descended into Shiloh. But what happened while he was in the grave. In Christian theology, the heroine of hell describes the triumphant descent of Christ into hell between the time of his crucifixion and his resurrection. The New Testament teaches that Jesus preached the gospel and brought salvation to all the righteous who had died since the beginning of the world. The Apostle Paul taught that Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and rose triumphantly leading captivity captive. The early church also believed in the descent of Jesus into hell. We see this proved by the stanza that Jesus descended into hell in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. The rod and staff are tools used by a shepherd to nurture and protect his flock. Rods were used as weapons of defense or offense, while staffs were used to nurture and control the sheep. Now, we should understand why the Good Shepherd's rod and staff will comfort us. Jesus descended into hell, also known as Shiloh, and used the rod and staff of a shepherd to lead the deceased faithful into paradise.
Jesus is the Messiah. But did King David envision the life and ministry of the Messiah in his 23rd Psalm? The answer is yes. The picture of Jesus being our shepherd and walking through Shiloh is coming into focus. Part 1 of this video series explored the connections between Jesus and the Good Shepherd seen in the 23rd Psalm. More is to come in the following episodes.